Hey everyone, I'm Nick from Coffee Before Art, and in this episode of Computer Organization and Design, we're going to be moving on from the eight great ideas in computer architecture, and really focus on one of them being abstraction today, and that's going to be in this section called Below Your Program. So when we've got some big piece of software, or even a small piece of software, right, so it could be something like a big large database, or, you know, something that's not, say, millions of lines of code, maybe just a few thousand. A lot of times these things rely on sophisticated software libraries that do very complex functions for us. However, you know, deep down when we start talking about the processor, the, the hardware itself has, a, you know, only a subset of things that it can actually do, right? And these things are often extremely simple, just very low level operations. So things like add, subtract, multiply, divide, uh, and do comparison operations. And, you know, the reason why this works so well is that you know, I can have something that's written in a very high level language that does complex things. And then once it gets it down to the processor, uh, you know, it can be translated into something that's just a sequence of very, very simple operations. But I don't have to worry about, you know, what's going on underneath. I can just worry about my high level code. And that's really uh, comes from this great idea of abstraction, right? So how do we abstract a high level language from, you know, the low level assembly language that's actually getting executed? So it all comes down to this idea of having abstraction. So up here at the very, you know, very outer layer, we'll have something like application software. So this will be your database or, you know, even something as simple as a hello world program. Uh, then in between the hardware and the application software, you've got something known as system software. Now system software is described here as, um, you know, providing services that are useful like uh, operating systems, compilers, loaders, and assemblers. But what it really boils down to a lot of times is this is software that's going to be using system calls in order to talk with the operating system. So the operating system itself, you can think of as a program that's running all the time that helps us manage resources. And it's really just there to get our programs to run or help, help us run our programs. And so it's gonna handle things like basic input and output, allocation of resources like storage and memory, and then providing you know certain protections. So you know, certain processes maybe shouldn't interact or intermingle in terms of, you know, reading from each other's address spaces. Uh, likewise, certain users shouldn't be allowed to, say, read certain files. So we have to protect that as well, or uh, we have to protect from that as well. And the, how we interact with the operating system is, like I said, through system software, which use system calls. Uh, but the key thing is, is while the operating system has to worry about, you know, actually interacting with the hardware, System software just has to worry about a nice clean interface of system calls. And likewise, application software, it doesn't have to worry about, you know, using these system calls. It has itself a nice clean interface to interact with. So let's say I'm working in a high level language like Python, and I want to say read in a string from the user. Now in my code, I can just write something like input, and eventually I'll get, you know, some string that I type in on the keyboard, I press enter, and then I'll have it in my program. Now, the nice thing here is that I don't have to worry about, you know, how does something that I type on my keyboard get, you know, go through, say, the USB connection that my keyboard's attached with and eventually get into memory or into the processor and actually get, you know, spit back out and displayed on the screen. I don't have to worry about that. It's abstracted away from you, uh, from me. And that's where abstraction can be really, really beneficial, right? And so system software is... Uh, one of the ways we get the, you know, the separation between the applications we write and the actual execution on hardware, right? So um, the way that we we get something though, the, these complex programs, they still have to be, again, boiled down to the instructions that a processor understands. And this abstraction is, you know, is enabled by the fact that we have compilers now. So compilers, they basically perform a translation from our C, C++ programs into that instruction set that the actual processor itself can understand. Now, compilers can often be broken down into a number of parts, right? It can be broken down usually into a preprocessor, the compilation stage, you know, generating object code, uh, and then, you know, actually doing the linking before you have an executable that can run. But, you know, a lot of times we just refer to all of these things together as being done by the compiler and the entire process is just being compilation. So we can just think of, you know, the compiler as being a program, you know, just like the programs that we've written, that translates uh, a high-level language statement into assembly language statements, 
right? So we can write very complex things, but fundamentally it has to be transformed into something the processor can understand. So it's important that we talk a little bit about these fundamental instructions. Now these fundamental instructions are really just going to be, you know, they're going to be similar to uh, words, you know, in the English language. We have a limited space that we can, uh, we have a limited space uh, for these words, right? And so this is an instruction. So an instruction, uh, it'll be a sequence of bits. So bits being uh, just an individual, you know, base two, one, or zero. Uh, and we have to encode some operation like addition or subtraction into say, you know, 32 bits of uh, ones and zeros, right? And so that's, we can think of, you know, these 32 bits of ones and zeros being kind of like a word in the English language. So just like we string together, you know, the alphabet A through Z into something that has meaning, we string together a sequence of bits that uh, that ends up having a meaning, right? And so an instruction is just going to, you know, we can just think about that as a command that uh, the hardware will actually understand and obey. Now we can actually kind of break this down into two sections. So we can break it down into the assembly code. Now the assembly code is just going to be a human readable form of the instructions that we execute. So this will be something that we get from the compiler. And then we typically call the program that takes this human readable um, set of instructions and turns it into something that the CPU will understand being the ones and zeros, we call this typically the assembler, right? Um, and what it does is it changes this assembly code into a uh, machine language or machine code, uh, something that now, like it implies, the machine understands. Now, uh, it's important though that we still kind of tie this all back to, you know, why do we care about having high level programming languages in the first place, right? So if we have to go through all this, you know, pain of translating a program, you know, starting from, you know, a high level language like C, so this is just a simple function that performs a swap operation between two elements in an array. And then we have to compile it down into you know, here's some assembly code um, that does the exact same thing as that C code, but it's in the instructions that the CPU understands. And then we have to pass that again uh, to another another program being the assembler that'll turn it into the zeros and ones. You know, this seems like a lot of effort. So why do we actually care about this? And there's actually a number of reasons why we, we do care about this and we care about this a lot. Um, so one of the important benefits is that we can use, you know, English English words and algebraic notation. So when we're doing some kind of operation like addition, we can write it out like we would on a piece of paper. So we can type out A plus B. But in you know assembly language, this would have to be you know in the instruction set. So it would have to be add A comma B. And the important distinction here is that this might not just be A plus B, right? So we could have something like A plus B divided by seven, times nine or something. And it's very unlikely that we're going to have an instruction that performs this entire operation. So inside, if we were to write this in say assembly language, we would have to, you know, we'd have to synthesize this operation using multiple instructions. So we'd have to say, do an addition, uh, or rather we'd have to do say this division, we'd have to do a multiplication, then we'd have to do an addition. So we would have to kind of synthesize this entire thing out of multiple instructions. But in a high level language, we can just write it out on a single line that's intuitive for us to understand. Likewise, you know, there's what we call domain specific languages. So, you know, maybe we've got a domain, a domain specific language for something like uh, molecular dynamics, right? So if we've got a specific language that's meant to help out and is catered towards programming things to deal with, you know, simulating molecular molecular dynamics, then, you know, it's a lot easier for me to write my program in that language than it would be to do it in some arbitrary instructions of say, just addition, subtraction, multiplication. So it really helps with productivity. And uh, the other thing is the idea of portability that we, we kind of touched on earlier. So, um, when it comes to portability, right? So if I'm, you know, an application writer um, or an application developer, and I've got some program that does some neat thing that I want to run on, you know, everybody's computer. Well, not everybody has the same processor. And if I'm the application writer, and let's say that it's, 
you know, the years before a compiler existed, well, if I wanted to have that application run on everybody's computer, it would need to be written in every single computer's instruction set, right? And that's a lot of work. Now, the nice thing about compilers and this idea of abstraction is that the application writer can write their code in, say, uh, you know, C or C++ or something, and then we just need a compiler on every single computer, and then we can just take that that one uh, single you know application and just recompile it on every single uh, for every single architecture target, right? So we get this great uh, this great portability, and we're separating the fact that you know the application writer uh, doesn't have to know about the underlying hardware. They can abstract themselves away and really just focus on uh, just focus on their software. So these are kind of the, you know, the main benefits of abstraction and some of the layers that we'll see abstraction as we go uh, into this book. So, you know, next in the, uh, in the next video, we'll go into the section 1.4 under the covers and we'll start talking about, you know, what is actually inside of the CPU and the different facets of the architecture that we're going to be uh, discussing later in this book. But that's going to go ahead and do it for this episode. As always, check out you know any of the other series that I work on uh, on this channel. So I've got stuff on, let's go to the repositories. So we've got stuff on parallel programming in C++. Um, I've got a collection of my research utilities here, which you may or may not find useful. But I also have series on C++ programming, systems programming. So we talked about system calls today. So if you want to know a little bit about Linux systems programming, uh, you can feel free to check this out. Things like GPU programming with CUDA. So let's just take a look at systems programming. So we've got stuff like you know file creation, um, opening and closing files, and we can even see, you know, so we've got you know the YouTube video here, and then likewise we've got the actual um, C file here that you know, you know this would be you know it's a very simple example of system software, but this would be an example of system software. But like I said, that's going to do it for this video. I'm Nick from Coffee Before Arch, and I hope you have a nice day.